let's get into the challenges of filming underwater. And I'm going to assume that all of you have read the first part of the book, Section 1, before we're doing this course. And if you have not read Section 1, I highly recommend, once again, I highly recommend that all of you stop this streaming tutorial and go back and read the book. First of all, water absorbs color. And we talked about this in the book. And that is one of the biggest challenges about filming underwater. The reality is reds are gone after 12 feet, yellows are gone after 18 to 19 feet, and greens are gone after 28 feet. So anything that you're going to be filming from far away, anything over 30 feet, it's going to be blue. And when you go to wind up looking at some of the shows that are on PBS or Discovery Channel, and they have underwater videos, almost all the video is blue. Secondly, we record in a low light environment. And because of the lack of light, we get what's called gain in the film. That's the fuzziness that we're going to see as part of the video tutorials. And gain is an issue and a battle you're always going to have. And it's prevalent in the blue spectrum. And because it we're filming underwater, we are filming in a blue spectrum and on top of it, a low light environment that winds up increasing the gain, especially for consumer level camcorders that have very small sensors. On the Hollywood level camcorders that they shoot on 35 millimeter that have very large sensors and therefore that they perform much better underwater than a camcorder that's 500 to three thousand dollars i don't have a hundred grand to blow on on that camcorder and probably either to you but we've come up with very innovative ways to do what's called denoising using the matting system to get rid of that noise third you have to battle contents and there's no solid ground to film on when you're underwater and you're floating along the reef or you're filming you do not have your feet on stationary ground and if you do i hope you're not touching the coral Unlike topside, we can't easily take up and pick up and move a tripod around. They were not sitting on solid ground. It is critical, and I'm going to say this again, a critical that you have practiced your buoyancy when you're going to wind up doing underwater filming. The fourth item on here, we have limited time. We're not like we're filming topside and we have 15, 20 minutes or a half an hour to do white balancing or adjust the iris or focus settings which are on the camcorder we have very limited time underwater the typical person their tank lasts for an hour you i and anybody else filming underwater does not have the time to fiddle with their camcorder for 15 or 20 minutes to do all these different things people may recommend and i have a long discussion about this as part of the video tutorials that i only like to use two controls power on and off and start and stop I don't use zoom. Sometimes I'll use white balance, but not all the time. I don't like to fiddle with controls. I like to go down and the most important thing is doing what's called the lockdown shot that we're going to talk about and the way that you wind up approaching the critters that have those critters in the middle of your screen. So I have limited time when I'm down filming and by the time, some days that I'll go do four tanks and by that fourth tank, I'm flat out cold. Fifth, you get what mother nature is going to provide. And if any of you have watched how Hollywood does a regular movie, they lay out and draw storyboards of all the different scenes that they're going to wind up filming. That is not the way it works in a nature environment. It is not the way that it works underwater. Besides battling the currents and not being on solid ground and having limited time, you cannot turn around and say at 10 o'clock in the morning, Mother Nature is going to deliver a green sea turtle. Or Mother Nature is going to send... A gigantic reef shark my way it doesn't work that way you are going to film what mother nature decides that she wants to bring you and you have to be prepared when those money shots come by when those manta rays when those sharks when those file fish when these colorful creatures come by you have to be prepared to film them and to film them effectively and not waste time. And that's what the 20 rules are about, is for you to think about these concepts so that when those money shots come by, you are prepared to approach that critter in a systematic method with the right color tone in your monitor. Continuing challenges of filming underwater are, one, sea critters don't pose for a camera. The green turtle is not gonna turn around 
turn and face your camera and start waving his flipper. We also talked about that there's no planned storyboard. Third, critters and you are going to be moving in a three-dimensional space. And that's what water is. When we're on ground, when you're going along the ground, you're moving in two-dimensional space. If you're walking on a flat surface, you are moving either forward or backwards or to the left and right. But you are moving in a two-dimensional space. In water, you are moving in a three-dimensional space. And the critters are moving in a three-dimensional space. And that adds a whole other level of complexity. So let's just give a perfect example. It is much harder to film a flying flock of birds flying through the sky than it is to film a person who's on the same plane on the ground as you. We all know that. So even though the critters underwater don't move as fast as birds, we still have the same concepts that you're filming in a three-dimensional space. You also have, under number four, equalization and depth limits. There's only a certain limit that you can go to, and we talk about safety as part of the book. When you're chasing these critters, if they are going down and you're holding that camcorder, you are going to have to find a way to be able to equalize without having to touch your nose. If you have to wind up going and squeezing your nose to be able to equalize, your camera is going to get out of balance and it's going to be shaking these issues when you're descending that they're going to come into play. Number five, you have varying topside conditions. You can wind up going out on a boat you don't know what's going to happen. It may be wavy. The waves may be heavy. Your equipment's going to be bouncing around all over the place. And I want you to think about bringing an extra towel that you can roll up or fold over a couple times to place your unit on when you're on that boat because you never know what the conditions are going to be. So previously, we talked about that water absorbs color. And water is approximately 800 times denser than air. And this density absorbs light quickly. Not only does this result in dull, monotone colors, but it also decreases contrast and the image sharpness. As part of this course, we are going to show you that if you film with a red filter and you use some lights and you have those lights properly positioned, that you are going to get amazing colors to come back. If you adhere to one of our other rules, which is to film at 35 feet and less, you are also going to be able to get amazing colors to come back. But on here that we can clearly see that red is absorbed first, yellows then disappear, greens are then gone, and then the only thing you're left with is blue. But what this chart says is that at approximately 70 feet, there is going to be no green in the water. All the sunlight coming down has been absorbed. After 30 feet, yellows are gone. And after approximately... Uh, uh, 10 feet reds have disappeared and that's why that we recommend filming with a red filter as part of the guide as part of what you read we always recommend filming with a red filter because if you don't have a red filter on or you don't have lights and you're down at 70 feet you're not getting any colors in fact if you're below 30 feet you aren't going to get any yellows or red now let's start on the main part of our morning session which is the 20 basic rolls and I thought about this really long and hard about what are the 20 most important basic things that I have learned and I think about when I go to film underwater. And these 20 basic rules, after we go through them, they make complete common sense. Rule one, test your underwater unit. And I extensively discussed about this in the guide. First of all, go and wind up setting up and go out with your dive master and set up markers at 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet, 60 feet, 70 feet, 80 feet, and take your camcorder down, set up, preferably on a tripod, because you want that camcorder to be steady, and you first film a minute of film at each one of those depths without a red filter or, or your lights on. And in the same position, I want you to put the red filter on the camcorder without the lights on. And then I want you to now, with the red filter on, film another minute with the red filter and the lights on. And I want you to do it every one of those levels at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, etc. Bring that film back up and as part of this course then wind up taking that film and running it through the color correction procedures that you're going to learn as part of this course. And that is going to determine the limits of your camcorder. Once again, that is going to determine the limits of your camcorder. 
By doing these procedures, you are going to figure out when you film with a red filter or with lights on, the reach of those lights, whether or not that you're going to be able to get colors to come back. And I'm going to give you a perfect example. One of our units we film with is the JVC 3D camcorder. That camcorder returns brilliant colors above 35 feet. It, but it does not matter. When I take that camcorder below 35 feet, I am not going to get the colors to come back and I get a lot of gain in the film. I learned that limitation as part of the camcorder. We have a second more expensive unit, which is the Panasonic HDZ Z10000, which has got independent 3C MOS sensors on it and therefore is actually made for a low light environment. And that is a fantastic camcorder It films in 3D and 2D. And I can take that thing down to 100 feet with a red filter and lights on and I'm able to get colors to come back. Well, I just got done as I discussed in uh, the lesson shooting angles and the use of water. I have a discussion about it. I went to the Grand Caymans and the HDC housing was stuck in customs and I wasn't able to get it for the first three days. And I wanted to film the great towering walls of the Grand Caymans. And I only had my backup JVC unit and I had to completely rearrange my schedule. And I stuck the 35 feet and it took all my willpower and fortitude to not to go below 35 feet. But in the end, I got a ton of great shots. I got my housing out of custom and I was able to get those deep wall dives and I wound up with a tremendous amount of fantastic footage at 35 feet and less that I wound up mixing with the wall shots and the results were fantastic. If I had not understood the limitation of my camcorder and had just blindly gone out and started diving, all that film I would have had below 35 feet I would have thrown in the trash. So one of the things I want you to do, especially when you go to the clear waters in the Caribbean, is on your first two dives, take that camcorder and figure out on the underwater environment you're filming in, what are going to be the results that you're going to wind up getting. And that's why we stay under number five, stick within your camcorder limits. Determine the sweet spots. Have on here that we have 20 feet, 40 feet, 60 feet, 80 feet, and re-emphasizing again, always stay within the limits of your camcorder. If you want to get good film, and believe me, after you wind up using our techniques and you go through and color correct your film, that old film you used to do in the colors, you're never going to wind up using that film again moving forward. You will want to have bright colors and all this old film that you've had that you haven't gotten the great results that you wanted, you're not going to wind up wanting to get that type of film anymore. On this third slide, we're once again re-emphasizing film within the sweet spots because I just have to tell you, this is such an important concept to properly understand your camcorder. It's going to wind up increasing your confidence and ability to get great film. After you go down to the Caribbean and you wind up doing these tests and you understand where your camcorder, where these sweet spots are and what depth limits that you're going to film at, the way your lights have got to be angled, your confidence is going to go through the roof. And instinctively moving forward, you are going to understand what is going to work and what's not going to work. If you film outside of your camcorder's capabilities and the film is no good, there's only going to be one person to blame and that's going to be yourself. If you go down to 90 feet and you don't have a red filter on or you're trying to hit that coral without lights, you're not going to be able to get that film to come back. There is no miracle to fix film. And we're actually going to see in a slide later on, there's four things that are going to determine your film coming back. First is going to be the camcorder and the size of its sensor. The second thing is going to be whether or not that you use a red filter. The third is going to be the type of lights you use. And then the fourth is going to be your post-production. And if you properly use a red filter with lights, the tools we use are going to immensely, once again, I'm going to say this again, immensely improve the colorization of your film. But you're going to have to have all four of those items working together. So an example, if you go down with your camcorder 90 feet, you don't have a red filter, and you're trying to hit coral from 10 feet away, you don't have lights, our tools are not going to help. If you wind up sticking within these type of things that we're discussing, you are going to be able to get the great film to come back. And I highly recommend all of you go to the website and purchase 3D Coral Reef Aquarium and you are going to see what we were able to get with a $1,000 camcorder, which most likely the people reviewing this class, that is in the range of the camcorders that you're using. And if we can do it, you can do it. But the first rule... I stick within the limits of the camcorder. On my JVC 3D unit, 
35 feet and above. I do not go below 35 feet with that camcorder. The Panasonic HDZ Z10000 has independent 3 CMOS sensors. I can go down to 100 feet with that thing and get great colors. Now let's go to rule two. We've talked about 35 feet numerous times. Film at 35 feet or less if possible. And I'm going to deviate here just for a quick second. That's why I love Bonaire so much. First, it's shore diving. And I don't have to go out with dive masters. But that reef also starts in about 15 or 20 feet of water. And at 30 feet, you have a huge biosystem floating around there with tons of fish in many places starting in 15 feet. And that's one of the ways that we get our great colors back is that we enjoy to do shallow dives along with some deeper dives and great get those great color results depending upon your camcorder. So if you film at 35 feet and less, one, you're going to get better colors because you have more light. And as we saw on that chart showing you, once you go below 70 feet, the only thing you're going to get is blue unless you have a red filter and artificial lights. The shallower you are, the more scenes that you're able to get. Two, light is always better at 35 feet and above than if you're in the deep. Three, the top of the reef line and 20 feet below it is where the best sea life is. If you have a reef line starting at 30 feet, all the activity, the massive activity of the fish is going to be from five feet above that reef line to the next 20 feet. If you go down to 80 feet, almost all the fish are gone. I like to get scenes, as we're going to see in Lesson 17, the use of water and angles, and specifically using water as a movement in the scene and the angles of the camcorder. I like to set up with a lot of light, and I like to set up where there's the best sea life. Number four, shallower depths equal more dive time. We all know that the deeper you go, your air is going to get compressed and your dives are going to be shorter. I have stories about this all the time. I went out filming with people that are pretty famous underwater videographers and they were acting like that we were in a fraternity and going down to 130, 150 feet. Finally, I just turned around and told them, I said, you're not getting any colors to come back and you're going all the way down to 150 feet. You're down there seven minutes. What are you doing? <laughs> Well, to me, it just seems stupid. At 30 feet, my tank that normally lasts about 55 minutes, I'm going to get an hour and 15 minutes out of that tank. All of a sudden, I have another 20 minutes or another 40% dive time that I'm sitting down there going along the shallower reef, and I have more time to actually wind up getting the critters I want to get. Under number five, by filming at shallower depths at 40 feet and above, you have less of a chance of decompression illness. And in the book, I talked about an accident that I had that even though I said I was whacked out for about six weeks, it was, it was a much longer period of time than that. I had a decompression accident. Part of it was related to, frankly, some irresponsible behavior I had because I was filming. At these shallower depths, you are actually going to have a much less chance of decompression illness. Your tanks are going to last a lot longer, probably 50% longer. Your dives are going to last longer. You're going to wind up saving a lot of money. And all the fish is sitting at that reef line and 20 feet below it. So you're going to get the best shots in the end anyway. Rule three, our one eye roll. After we've gone through these 20 rules of filming underwater, that we go over the one eye roll. And what you want are the best shots or where the critter is facing forward or to the side and you have at least one eye or more in the shot. Filming critters be from behind, filming their tails, all that film is not going to give you the wow factor and is not going to excite people. You want those shots where you have at least one eye in the camera where that critter is going to be perpendicular or parallel to the camera facing you and directly into the front. As part of some of the video tutorials that we're going to go over, we actually talk about that role. Two, behind the critter shots are throwaways. I used to go and film and I'd be following the critters and get their tails and I was all excited and then I would spend a lot, lot of time doing the color correction. But now, in the end, almost all that film got thrown away, and I'm looking for those special shots, those magical, what I call money shots, where I have these critters facing me to the side with at least one eye. Best shots, the critter is facing me straight ahead with both eyes in the camera. Under three, these backside shots just do not create excitement. Four. Delete shots where all you have is tail. Unless you have a great white shark or a big shark, a whale shark, tail shots, right now I don't keep any of them. 
So I want you all to remember that. Save your energy. Save your time. We're actually going to discuss filming strategy as part of these rules. If you're going after a critter and all you're doing is filming them from behind, don't waste your energy in air. Five, front end shots require a proper position. And we're going to talk about this very extensively. If you want that front side shot, you are going to have to be prepared before you approach that critter and think about the strategy, how you're going to be able to get to that critter and not scare it off. Because when you're filming from the front, that critter is going to be apprehensive because they're used to darting away and swimming away from you. So you're going to have to be very conscious of the type of techniques and the amount of time that you take to logically approach that critter with your gear set up. If you want to wind up approaching a Barracuda, as we're going to see in how to wind up setting up your shots, and you're fiddling with your lights and you're moving the camcorder around to try to get it into the middle of the screen, that Barracuda is gone. When you want to get these front end shots and you see a critter out there, I want you to stop, think, and react for a couple seconds to get your camera set up, get those lights in the proper position, wind up having that critter in the middle of the viewfinder before you start your approach. Rule four, film with the current. And this is particularly applicable as far as filming in Cozumel. I filmed in Cozumel in May and June, and in some of the reefs, the current was very strong. That's why I'm going to have a discussion about it. First, always film in the direction of the particulates. A lot of time that you're going to go out and film, especially you may have some stormy weather. In October, I was filming in Bonaire. It rained every single day that I was there. It was, it was a disappointment, even though I went up north to the island and dove off of a concrete pad called Carpata. And then I swam 150 yards to the left to Ladonia's Leap. And I went up there because there's no sand. But sometimes you're going to get in the water and you're going to have particulate, whether it be sand in the water, whether it just be particulate matter floating around. Film in the direction of the current and in the direction the particulates are moving. If you film against the current and the particulates, those particulates are going to be coming towards your camcorder. And if you have lights on, you are going to get a tremendous amount of scatter and problems regarding your film. And as those particulates wind up approaching your lens, if you have it on autofocus, it's going to result in some issues and throwing your camcorder out of whack. And I found out in three years of experience, if I'm filming in the same direction of the current, therefore I'm filming in the direction that the particulates are moving, I usually get a, a lot less backscatter and a lot less lens distortion going on in my film. But that's what we talk about under number two, going with the current lessens backscatter. Three, you have less effort to remain neutrally buoyant. You want to try to have that camera be steady and try to get into a lockdown mode and keep the subject you're filming in the middle of the viewfinder screen. And in order to do that, you're going to have to be able to practice to remain neutrally buoyant. I found personally, it's just easier for me to remain neutrally buoyant when I'm going with the current. Four, you're going to have more control over your camcorder. If you are going in the direction of the current, you aren't going to get that push factor from the water coming up against your camcorder. And some of these housings, let's say the HD6 or the HD10 housing from Equinox, they can wind up taking up a tremendous amount of space, especially the HD10. And having a lot of movement rolling up against that camcorder can wind up pushing it around, especially if you have that camcorder perpendicular to where the current is going. So if you wind up filming with the current, that's going to cause less movement in your camcorder. Number five, when you're filming with the current, you want the least amount of shake and the movement in that camcorder to get the lockdown shots. And filming with the current is going to help provide that additional control. And I always say this, you can take a horse to water and you can't make a drink, or you can film with the current or against it. I always want to film with the current. Rule five, use a tripod if possible. 
And as part of what we're going to see on the use of water and shooting angles, we extensively have a discussion in there during the 52-minute video tutorial showing you multiple shots, what we refer to as a lockdown shot. And a lockdown shot is going to be done on a tripod where there is absolutely no movement in the camcorder. And how I really kind of explain this to people is imagine that you have a big screen TV sitting in your living room and you are playing a video. There is no movement in that camcorder. It's almost as if the four corners of the screen are a fish tank. And when you're looking at your fish tank at home, the four corners of that fish tank do not move. The critters are floating around and swimming around and they're going back and forth. But that scene, that plane that you're looking at is not moving. And that's what we refer to as a lockdown shot. And I find that lockdown shots are the best. So one of the things I want all of you to do is when you go on Discovery Channel or you go on the PBS and they may have an underwater show, I want you to think about when you watch the way they're filming is how that camera is not shaking and you're going to notice a tremendous amount of shots that they have was done on a tripod. Under number two, if you're going to use a tripod, I want every one of you to practice in a pole before leaving and there's two reasons for that. First of all, the, new, the unit that you're going to have in the tripod, you have to get used to swimming with that tripod and what works for you for you to be able to collapse it relatively quickly, be able to move to another spot in the pole and then set up in the pole. Secondly, your buoyancy is going to change with that tripod. So you want to know how that winds up affecting your buoyancy before you wind up getting on a dive boat and frankly making a fool out of yourself. Thirdly, you want to be underwater and feel and get used to the additional cumbersomeness that you're going to have of having to carry a tripod around. Now with me, I have my daughter or wife wind up going with me to film and while they look for critters, they'll also wind up taking the tripod down until I wind up getting to the spot I want to set up in. And then I usually attach the tripod to the tripod holder on the camera and I'll just kind of go along the reef with the legs collapsed, maybe extending down two feet until I find a spot and I wind up lowering the legs again. But you need the practice in the pole, including dealing with all the knobs and twists and everything which is going on in your tripod. And you also want to practice with that unit topside. Now, I do not recommend taking your housing units, and some of these things can weigh 20 to 60 pounds, and practice on ground with it because the tripods I use are about 80 bucks and they're made out of plastic and if you try to do it above ground you'll wind up breaking that tripod and that's one of the things you're going to have to be conscious of is that you actually want to get in that underwater environment and see how hard it is to turn all the dials. Number three, if you're going to use a tripod and we talk about this in the use of water, I like to get shots and I'm relatively a couple two three feet below the subjects and I'm trying to film and I like the position and turn that tripod where I have water across the top of the screen and I'm pointing it at a 45 degree angle towards the surface and getting a complete lockdown shot where that coral is not moving but I have the critters naturally going within the environment they're living in and I'm not swinging that camcorder to the left and right and you'll see when we wind up using the Boris continuum complete optical stabilizer tool for the tripod shots and the adobe warp stabilizer for shots as i'm swimming along the reef these tools do a great job especially the boris optical stabilizer if you're using a tripod number four be conscious of the fact that you need to set up in the sand and not on the coral if you are going to try to get a tripod shot or a lockdown shot, it doesn't mean that you now have the right to take your camcorder and start plopping it on top of the coral. These are very fragile structures that take many years to grow. And if you're going to wind up setting up a tripod, look at where you're placing the legs and try not to set up where the tripod is hitting the coral. Once again, these are fragile structures. You've all taken this as part of your open water diver class, your advanced diver class. Some of you may have gone the rescue diver. The coral is not there to wind up giving damage because you want a lockdown shot. So unless you can wind up setting up a lockdown shot, preferably on the sand, nice burn groove type of reef structures serve that purpose. Be conscious of this fact. 
And now we're going to go to number five. And number five, if you're going to use a tripod, you got to overweight yourself. Going out and saying, I put 12 pounds on with that tripod, you are going to have to have additional weight because when you decide to set up the tripod shot, I let all the air out of my BC and I sink right down to the sandy bottom. I want something where I'm crouching down and I have my knees on the sand and I'm holding that camcorder now. Especially if you have a camcorder sitting on a tripod and you are in an environment that has a wave action going back and forth, that tripod is going to move. I have to wind up grabbing the camera by both of my angles and pushing that camera down on the tripod to get the steadiness. And by having an extra two or three pounds sitting in my BC, that that allows me to sink much faster and be able to get set up in a much more effective way and not have to worry about getting pushed all over the place by the current. Before you go on a trip and you've decided that you want to try to film with a tripod and you've practiced in your pole and you've gotten all the knobs down and you're used to swimming around in your pole with the tripod, you need to confirm that a tripod is going to be allowed. If you go on a cattle boat in Cozumel, they are not going to allow you to bring a tripod on that boat. If you go to the Grand Cayman Islands, they are not going to allow you to bring a, a tripod on that boat. So whatever dive operator that you're going to be going with, you have to make sure that you give them a phone call and tell them that you're going to be, you want to use a tripod and whether that's going to be okay. If you're going on a dive junket, make sure you go and you talk to your dive shop owner. He's going to say it's okay for you to use a tripod. You don't want to turn around and call up the dive operator and he says it's okay to use a tripod and then you go to your dive shop owner on a dive junk and he says he's not going to let it happen. So you really have to confirm this type of information. It's just a couple phone calls. If you wind up calling and that operator will not allow you to use a tripod, you call up another operator. What you don't want to do under number two is do not negotiate at the dock. Do not assume because that you're coming from the United States and you're an American that you can go down to Mexico or the Grand Cayman Islands or the Bahamas and do whatever you want because it's not going to happen. These people have laws. you got to respect the rules. They're very conscious about their economy, many times based on the scuba diving industry, and they may not wind up allowing you and do not want you to bring that tripod. This is not something that you negotiate at a dock. You have to have all this worked out before you get on the airplane. Sometimes I've gone out on boats and I don't really dive on cattle boats anymore. I've gone out on a boat and some person from Tennessee who's gone scuba diving twice starts shooting their mouth off on the boat. And I've done thousands of dives and I know what I'm doing and it just irritates me, but I never get mad at them. I just turn around as I said in there, ma'am, I appreciate your comment. I will be very conscious. I only set up my tripod in the sand. I do not put it on the coral. I'm very conscious of these fragile ecological environments. But you're going to have to be prepared for that. If you decide to go on a cattle boat, you are going to be have to prepared for that. If you go on with a dive junket, you are going to have to be prepared for that. Do not get angry. Do not make a frown on your face. Just turn around and say, I appreciate your concern. I've done many dives. I have a lot of experience filling with a tripod. I only set up in the sand. I'm very conscious not to touch the coral. I have found out that the best way to use a tripod when I want to use one is just to get a private boat. And that usually costs me about $100 more a day. I don't get harassed. I can go out in peace. And usually the private boats are faster and we go to better spots to film on anyway. And a lot of times the dive masters will know some sites where there's the ability to wind up setting up. That's why I like to go to Bonaire. There's no dive masters and there's no dive boat. I just go out from shore and I dive and I set up. If you're on a junket, confirm with the person leading the junket. Confirm with the owner of the dive shop that it's going to be okay for you to film with a tripod if you want to get those lockdown effects. I never really understood why people would get so concerned about using a tripod because I think it actually, if in fact that you're going to go for a lockdown effect, the best thing to have it on is a tripod. Instead of some people going out and deciding they want a lockdown effect, so they're just going to take their unit and wind up putting it on top of a piece of coral that they think is dead, when in fact that coral is actually alive and then they're kicking the coral all over the place. I think at least a tripod has you think about setting up in the sand and on a relatively flat area. And I think if you want a lockdown effect, it actually causes and will, and will result in less damage to the reef. Rule six, always wear a full wetsuit. When I go filming, I always wear a full wetsuit. Now, usually I do at least a minimum of three tanks a day, maybe four. 
by the time I'm done with that fourth tank, I am flat out cold, even if it's in August and I'm diving in Cozumel and that water is at the warmest that it's ever going to be. You just wind up losing a bunch of heat through your head, as we've talked about. And unfortunately, I don't like to wear a hoodie. Because it, you're going to be filming and concentrating on trying to keep a critter in the middle of your viewfinder, you are not going to be as conscious of what is going around you. That you're going along filming. I have a 5-inch monitor. I used to have a 3-inch monitor. But you may be filming with a 3-inch waterproof monitor or a 5-inch monitor. And that's a very little screen. You're going to be staring into it, including trying to wind up keeping the subject in the middle of the screen, and you are going to lose consciousness of your surroundings. And sooner or later, you're going to hit something. Now, everybody may turn around and say that what I'm saying here is terrible, but that is the truth of what's going to happen. Sooner or later, you're going to hit something. And my some of my favorite places that I like to film is over the shallow uprises of fire coral. I just love the yellows and the way the fingers of those corals come out. And I have jammed up against that coral numerous times. And if I did not have a full wetsuit on, I would have had bruises all over my legs or I would have had scars all over my legs. You're going to lose concentration in your surroundings because you're going to be staring into that viewfinder. You are not going to have the same breadth of view that you normally have and by having a full wetsuit it prevents scratches it presents bruises you also wind up maintaining more heat and remember under number five many corals can sting and cause cuts especially corals that you don't necessarily think about there are uh, a lot of instances that people actually explain about how fire coral but i found that there's many types of corals Many of them not discussed in a very prevalent way as part of the dive guides, but there are many different types of corals that can wind up causing stings to your skin. And I've had many instances when I've come back from a trip and my hands are swollen from getting whacked by the fire coral, and that particular swelling does not go down for about two weeks. So I want all of you to be conscious of this fact. When you're filming, I want all of you to wear a full wetsuit not a shorty, it's just protecting that you have, especially if you're going to use a tripod, that you are going to be kneeling on your knees, and you don't want your knees going into that sand, that you want something that's going to wind up giving you that protection. Rule seven, water across the top 25% of the screen. And we're going to see this extensively in filming angles in the use of water. I always want to have water across the top of the screen, 25% to 50% of the screen, I'm going to wind up capturing the animals. I have found that pointing my camera directly into the coral or pointing the camera directly down into the coral does not give the sense uh, and perspective of how massive some of these structures are. Secondly, as we're going to talk about in the video lessons, having that water creates a backdrop to make all of the other pops, all of the other colors pop. So one, the camera should not point into the coral. Two, have water in at least 25% of your scene. If you have a shot where you're steady, have water going across the top of the screen, have 25 to 50% of the scene in water. If you have coral on either side, the left or the right side of the scene, and you have water on the opposite side, try to have 25 to 33% of the scene have water in it. And we're gonna see video examples of this. Number three, water creates infinity space. And we talked about before that you are filming in a three-dimensional space. And that's what scuba diving is about. And I want all of you to imagine this. When you're looking at the critters, they are in a three-dimensional plane going down that reef line. Some are above you, some are below you, some are to the left, some are to the right. But they're filling up a tremendous amount of space the way that a flock of birds fills up the sky. And that's the way that you have to think about it, is that water creates that infinity space mechanism for people to be able to see critters reaching far back into the plane that you're filming. Number four, I talked about before, and we're going to have an extensive review that the rich blue makes other colors pop. And as I talked about in Lesson 17, if you go to the McNeil Lear Report or even your local television news station, I want you to turn it on. You're going to notice almost all the backdrop colors that they have in there are rich blue. And they do that for a purpose because blue creates a richness and makes reds, yellows, 
brown and whites pop. And we're actually going to see some of those examples as part of the film that we're going to look at. Now, I like to take my water, as we're going to discuss in one of the video tutorials, and actually use Boris Continuum Complete to lay down one mat for the coral and one mat for the water. And then I go in and I darken the water to make it a slightly darker blue to give it that tone to really make those corals come out. Number five, as we had talked about, water adds perspective and depth. And you are filming in a three-dimensional plane in water with all the fish floating from five feet away to 10 feet away or 20 feet away, floating in that infinity space adds perception and depth to your film. Rule eight, circle to get the correct water tone. A lot of times people film and they just go out and they film randomly. And when I first started filming, I would film randomly and I would wind up setting up my unit and I would point it into the direct line of sight as the sun. My water was washed out and I got over amped whites all over the place. We actually circle around the particular subject that we're going to film. And this applies to coral heads that have a lot of fish around them and also sea anemones. I swim around until I have the sun at the right angle that my water is turned to richer blue because I know that I'm going to be able to get the colors to come back better if I don't have one I'm filming to have hardcore sun reflection coming off of it. And that's something that you want to think about. Once you understand the way that we wind up correcting the colors, that you're going to understand the type of tone that we want in the water to be able to get that rich blue to come back. Sometimes I may circle around a coral head and I'll wind up getting changes in the look of the water from a washed out white blue to now switching the angle where the sun is behind me and I have that rich dark blue that I'm actually looking for. I understand that many of these concepts that we're discussing right now are hard to visualize, especially what's the right approach angle to get the better colors. And then we also talk about take your time and be patient. And number five is really important. You need to take your time when you're approaching these critters. And when you go to set up a shot, don't go rushing around. Your camera is just going to wind up being jerky. You actually want to set up and be extremely patient and maybe film in the same location for three to four minutes, especially if you're in a place that doesn't have current. You know, I tell people all the time is that if you get that tripod set up or you're in a stationary mode and you're filming, the critters are going to get scared and they go into the coral. But after about a minute, they all come out and they get used to that camcorder being there, including the tone of the lights. And they come out of the coral. And after about a minute to two minutes, you really get the full life coming back again. It hasn't been scared. I also wind up discussing, and we'll see in the video we're going to play after we're done going through all the rules, about approaching the critters and being patient and being very methodical in the way that you approach them. So I know that we talked about number three, swim in a semicircle. Number two, look at effects of sun or particles. And number four, having the right approach. So I'm just going to play a little about a minute and a half clip here that's actually out of the video from Lesson 17. So you can visualize and understand what we're talking about, a rich dark blue water. And if you had your camera point it up at the sun the way that it's going to wash out the color. So why don't we just go ahead and watch this little minute and a half and then we'll go for it. This shot we had a lot of the stuff right. We had water across the top taking up a third to a half of the screen. We're facing the camcorder into the sun and looked what happened. All of our water got washed out. It's not going to be a savable shot. We just had way too much lightness in here. It would take a tremendous amount of work to wind up getting this to work in the end that this shot would wind up getting cut out. And I just wanted to give you an example about being strategic when you actually go to set up. The one thing you want to make sure is that that tone in the water is going to be a little darker blue than this for us to be able to fix it. Otherwise, you wind up spending the time and effort of getting that tripod set up and you're not going to wind up using the film. But clearly, we can see how magnificent when we have that proper watercolor tone and we're using a lockdown effect and we have water, a tremendous amount of water with all the critters swimming in the background, creating that dark blue that's making the purples pop, the reds and orange really come out, the light yellows and even the brown colors have, are magnificent and it just creates a wonderful shot of what the ocean is really like. 
I just wanted to play a short clip from Lesson 17, which we're actually going to have a 52-minute discussion about a lot of the concepts, which we're actually going over now as part of the 20 rules, that we're going to visually look at some film and discuss the concepts once we wind up having our background done. And we saw that rich, dark blue and the way that it really makes a lot of these colors pop, including the fact that we had it in a lockdown mode and versus the first shot that we saw where we were pointing the camcorder and we had it at the sun, which was not at the right angle and the tone of the water just didn't come out very well. And we're not going to be able to wind up fixing that. And under rule three, when I say you swim in a semicircle and you used a viewfinder, you look for a tone in the water that's going to be a particular color that we know that we're going to be able to get those rich blues or these beautiful blues to go in in post-production and really get these wonderful, uh, colorful film that all of you were after. Now, that those pictures that you were viewing um, on the camcorder, we filmed those with the Panasonic HTC Z10,000. Once again, a 3 CMOS sensor camcorder. It just performs fantastic. So we're now at rule nine. Look down the reef and then beeline. And when we talk about this is people, when they go to film, they seem to only think and look at the reef of what is five or 10 feet in front of them. And that is really great if you're doing macro videography. And we're not covering macro videography as part of this course. What I do is I very slowly go along the reef, unless I'm looking for an effect where I'm swimming a little faster along, I want to get kind of a zoom effect along the reef. I'm looking down the reef and I'm looking for interesting subjects to film. And interesting subjects may start from 20 to 25 yards away. So I'm looking down that reef and what am I looking for? I'm looking for pods of fish. I'm looking for fish that are accumulated together, such as grunts, our trumpet fish, our tangs, whatever it may be, our damsel fish. I'm looking for groups of fish that have accumulated in a certain area of the coral. And what I do is I stop. And I go, okay, I see these fish. They're 10 or 20 yards away. They're down the reef. They're 30 feet away. I need to stop, think, and then act about how I'm going to approach them. I just don't start swimming towards the fish. My lights are on, aren't on. I don't have them positioned inside of the viewfinder. I stop. I get my lights. I turn them on so that when I'm approaching the fish, the lights are already going to be on. All of a sudden, they're not going to get a quick blast of light. I have my item set up, and then I get the fish inside the middle of the viewfinder. And now I start my approach. And that's what we're doing under item number four. Set up, position your lights, center the subject or the critter in the middle of your viewfinder, and now approach under control with buoyancy. And we talked before about how buoyancy is so important because you want to start filming and go after those critters in a straight line. Let's turn around and go now to rule 10. Think of shooting angles in water. And we're going to cover this extensively as part of the video tutorial that we're going to see after we're done going through the 20 rules. Number one, try to get surface water if possible in the shot. And the reason you want this is because if you're able to get your camera position at a 45 degree angle under number four in this list, you get nice water movement. And these shots are fantastic if you're filming at 30 feet and less that you have a lockdown effect upon that coral, but you have the movement going on in the water because you have part of the surface water as part of that shot. And folks, it looks fantastic. It adds an element of movement as part of the scene while your coral is perfectly still and you're letting the camcorder roll. You are allowing the film to roll and not moving that camcorder to the left or right to chase the critters. You're letting everything happen in its natural environment. We're going to see some of the film and I'm going to comment on this and you're going to understand this concept. Three, have the sunlight coming from behind. And we just saw that on that clip of film where I spent a lot of time getting the shot set up, getting my tripod set up, positioning my camcorder so that I water across the top of the screen. And what I failed to do was to acknowledge or realize my camcorder was pointing to the surface with the sun coming directly at that 
angle in front of the camcorder and I am not going to be able to fix that water. Four, I think that we saw in the first shot about how we point that camcorder at a 45 degree angle to try to get the surface in there. It's a really good effect. A lot of times I like to point the camcorder at an angle going up like that. So it's just not a straight on shot. And then number five, practice in the pull and master the knobs on the tripod. My tripod has got four different screws or knobs on it. It took a little while to wind up getting used to it. We talked about this before. Do not get on that dive boat and do not go in the water unless you completely understand all of the knobs that are on your tripod. And the only way to do it is to turn around and practice in a pull. So now we're going to go to rule 11. Always use a red filter. And of all the rules that we have besides rule 1, where we said to take your camcorder and test it at the various depths without a red filter and then with a red filter and then lights, we saw that after 60 to 70 feet, at that depth, you're not going to get any reds in your film at all. Even if you're filming straight on after 12 feet, reds disappear. Yellows are gone after 18 feet. And in order to get those colors to come back, you are going to have to have a red filter unless you're filming in macro with lights. Because if you have a red filter and you have lights, it's going to put a little reddish tone in the film, which we're actually able to correct in post-production. And number two, reds disappear after 10 feet. Three, with a red filter on, the post-production tools will work better. And I have a little story about this. That we switched over to filming with the Panasonic HTC Z10,000 because it has independent 3 CMOS sensors. And each lens has got over 7 million color receptors points on it. But whatever the kink is, was in that camcorder, if you do not have a red filter on it, it will not return one speck of red underwater. And I took that camera down without a red filter to Cozumel and May, and I was at Columbia Shallows at 18 feet, and I got absolutely no red in my film. When I brought up the video scope, there was absolutely no red getting recorded in the spectrum, and I thought that I had got a defective camcorder. Well, we actually went back to Equinox Housing, and they were kind enough to produce a customized red filter for us, and I just got done filming with that camcorder again in the Grand Cayman Islands in Bonaire, and it has returned unbelievable results by having a red filter on that camcorder it fixed all the issues and that's one of the things that i want to reiterate as part of our store is that the products we're selling are products that we use and have figured out how to use you don't have to go through all these different types of things and testing that we've done if you buy these products from our website you are going to wind up being happy and we don't do a shotgun approach number four it's always much easier to take red out than to put back in. One of the tools that we're going to show you is Boris Continuum Complete Color Adjust and Color Balance. And on the color balance, you can adjust the three main colors in the spectrum, which is RGB, red, green, and blue. And you can take red out, but if you don't have red in that thing, you can't put it back in. I would rather be over amped on the reds and wind up being able to fix it in post production versus having no red in the film at all. And I can't do anything. On the Panasonic, I even tried to lay a red overlay on the film and I just could not get the reds to come back in that footage. It's always much easier to take reds out. And if we're going to see on these fantastic tools from Boris Continuum Complete, you are going to be amazed at what it can do to your film. Number five, always have an extra red filter in your bag. And this is very important on number five, always have a red filter in your bag. I went on a trip and I scratched one of my red filters up against a piece of coral. And luckily I had followed my rules. I actually have three red filters that I take with me because when that lens gets scratched, your film is done. And if you wind up having an extra red filter, you are only going to wind up losing one die. These things cost anywhere from $30 to $100. Spend that $100, get the extra red filter, and make sure that you have an extra red filter sitting in your travel bag. They don't take up very much space, and they're going to wind up saving your dive trip. Because if your filter gets scratched on something like Bon Air, you are not going to be able to get another red filter. Or if it gets scratched even in Cozumel, you are probably not going to be able to get a red filter. You do not want your dive trip completely destroyed where you cannot film because you wind up getting a scratch on these red filters. And they are plastic. They scratch. They can crack. They get moved around. There's a lot that can wind up happening to them, including that we talked about having an extra towel on the boat. I've been on some very rough boat rides 
to get out to particular dive sites where those boats are going all over the place. And it can just by a freak accident happen that your camera tips over and something get, happens to that red filter that it winds up getting scratched. Now we're going to move to rule 12, take a computer with backup. And this is very important. One, always download and save your data at night. Let's say this again on rule number one. Always download and save your data at night. You always take that film off of that memory card or in the hard drive in the camcorder and you download that film every single day. You never know what's going to happen. I've had floods have happened in my units. Your unit could wind up getting ripped off. It could get damaged. You could drop it over the boat. There's a myriad and multiple things, disasters that could wind up happening. You need to save that data every night. What you do is when you get back to your hotel room, you just have your portable computer is already out. You take your camcorder and you immediately plug it into your computer and you download that film. Needless to say, probably most of you are doing this, but it is critical that you have to actually do this. Number two, have an external three terabit hard drive for backup. Just do not take your portable computer down there. Have an external three terabyte hard drives. Computers fail, they get stolen, you forget them. It's the same concept all over again. Just in Bon Air, my screen, the, my computer, on uh, my 3D portable computer from Toshiba went out on the last day that I was there. And luckily, I had backed up all of my film every night to an external three terabit hard drives. And these things are only $100. I was able to come home and I was up and running. If I had not backed up that data to an external hard drive and that computer was bad, I may have had to have spent a lot of money to get an expert to wind up getting that data off of the hard drive. It's just another peace of mind to have. Always take an external 3 terabit hard drive for backup. Three, review your film every night and rough cut. Maybe a lot of you are not going to do a rough cut. When I'm on location, I work every night till 12 o'clock where I take my film and because I film in 3D, I split it to a left right eye and then I do a rough cut of the film that I did during that day. I get rid of all the junky parts or the shake that I know I'm not going to be able to save or you know I have such an eye for film right now I can take a look at the watercolors and know whether I'm going to be able to get them back but the most important thing I want all of you to do is to review your film every night if you go back and you wind up reviewing your film and then I just got in the habit because I was reviewing it I was also cutting it that does take more time and effort. If you review your film every day, you will be amazed how fast your filming style is going to wind up improving. You may wind up thinking that you're moving that camera slowly. When you review it, you're swinging it around. You may think that you're swimming in a beeline and you have good buoyancy and you're all over the place. But by reviewing your film every night, your filming style is going to show massive improvement. Do not wait to review your film until you get back to your home state and you're putting your film on your computer. Your filming style and your filming improvements are going to show massive improvement and also by reviewing your film at night that is going to reinforce what depth levels your camcorder is actually performing at the best. And that is critical because all of a sudden you may find out that your camcorder is doing a great job at 40 feet but falls apart at 50 feet and therefore that you would be conscious when you're looking at your dive computer about what level that you're actually going to film at. That goes to number four. The review of film provides valuable feedback all the way down the line. Whether your buoyancy is any good, how steady your hands are, whether you're moving the camcorder too fast, what angles are working for your camcorder to get those rich blues that actually have the type of colorization you want, whether you're setting up correctly, how much shake is in your film, all these things by reviewing them every night, you will be shocked how you're going to go out the next day and wind up perfecting your style. And by the end of that seven day dive trip, you are going to be a great filmer. Number five, the first day will be a throwaway. It's okay. Even when I go and film and I go on three or four two week filming trips a year, even when I go to film, my first day is always a throwaway. I'm a little flustered, I'm carrying the unit around, I'm messing with the tripod again. Whatever the reasons are, it just takes me a day to get where all of a sudden it's like I'm riding a bicycle. By the second day, it's I'm back on that bike and I'm going down the hill and I'm doing great. But the first day is always a throwaway. Don't worry, if you go and film that first day and you don't have great film, 
Don't worry about it. If you go out the second day and you still don't have great film, don't worry about that either. Your style will improve. Everybody on their first day of filming, when they go to film again, unless you're diving constantly all the time, you will not have great results on that first day. So I don't want you to give up and I don't want you to get frustrated because I go through the exact same thing every one of you is going to wind up going through. When you get back and you wind up downloading your film, that you're going to notice your film towards the end of the dive trip was much better than the film in the first couple days when you're filming. That's just everybody because you just get more used to your unit, the buoyancy, how much weight that you have to have for that particular environment that you're in. All these factors come into play to make it that it's going to take a day or two for those natural bicycle skills to come back and you're filming like a machine again. Rule 13, fix the blue spectrum in post-production. We have a long lesson that you're going to go over, which is about using the image restoration tools in Boris Continuum Complete, and they have what's called a noise reduction tool. The noise appear in the film in the blue spectrum naturally, and most of these noise reduction tools were made to fix the sky. One of the techniques that we did that we decided and said, why don't we test all the noise reduction tools and see which ones actually have the best response in water. We chose the Boris Continuum Complete tool because they have a matting system which you are going to see and actually practice on and use for about two and a half hours on the second portion of this course. And Boris Continuum Complete has a great tool to wind up fixing noise. Number three, not all film is going to be saveable. You may wind up being at filming with your camcorder and you're at 60 feet and because if you're filming with a 500 to a $1,500 camcorder, which by the way, the GoPro camcorders have a real bad noise issue underwater and we address that issue as part of the Equinox Housing GoPro Guide to Filming Underwater that we show how to use these porous continuum complete tools to wind up fixing the noise in the water. But even with using some of these tools, not all of your film is going to be saveable. And there can be a host of issues. You're pointing in the sun, too much shake in the camera. There's just a lot of reasons why your film is just not going to be saveable. Four, inexpensive camcorders have small sensors. Once again, inexpensive camcorders have small sensors. And the more inexpensive they are, the smaller the sensor they have. That results in noise being recorded in a low light blue background environment and that is the environment we're filming in. that's one of the reasons why we wind up going to the panasonic hdz z10000 which is available for sale on our website that has independent 3c MOS sensors a lot of people have moved to the dslr cameras which have got a lot of advantages but they also have some drawbacks and those have got a larger sensor than the typical consumer level camcorder and number five, a 3 CMOS sensor performs better in light, and that's what the HCC Z10000 has. And I'll explain what a 3 CMOS sensor is. This is a sensor that breaks the light down into the RGB spectrum, the red, green, and blue. And they take that sensor plate and divide it up into three regions that independently record the colors. Versus on a Canon 2D camcorder we have, or the JVC 3D camcorders, all of the colors are splashing on the one sensor. If you're down at 50 feet, blue overtakes everything and crushes all the pixelization, even though we're able to fix the color really good. After a certain depth, you just cannot wind up bringing the colors back. The Panasonic HCZ Z10000 has 7 million color receptors and they divide up the plate into a separate recording for red, green, and blue RGB spectrums when we bring the color in the film the computer program or the color correction programs we use recognize a certain amount of red has been recorded in a certain part of the film and that makes the decision to actually return the red color and then all of a sudden bam all your colors are back on the coral if you can go out on the internet and read about three cmos sensors because they have the three color spectrums they also record better in a low light environment that's one of the reasons why we bought the Panasonic HEC Z10000 because that camcorder is made to perform in a low light environment. Rule 14, use the tools in the listed order. We're going to talk about a whole host of different subjects as part of this particular slide. And we're going to skip around between three slides. And I'm going to go to the next slide real quick. These are products that we actually discuss in the guide. And there is a lot of them. 
We have Adobe Creative Cloud, which is Premiere Pro that you're going to be doing the tutorials on. We talk about NVIDIA, Final Cut Pro, Sony Vegas Pro, Tiffin DFX, which when you see the tutorial on this product, it is just mind-blowing. Avid Media Composer. And all the tools that we're going to be demonstrating and using, we pick these tools for a couple of factors. One, they had to be easy to use. And two, we wanted to make sure that after you saw the demonstration of how we wind up using these tools, that you are going to be able to tell yourself with 100% confidence that you can do this. The tools that we have are not rocket science. They're very easy to understand and you're going to really love them. But these tools run inside of Avid Media Composer, Final Cut Pro, Sony Vegas Pro, and also Adobe Premiere Pro and Adobe After Effects. And that's why that we have chosen this particular tool set as part of these video tutorial lessons. Those four major programs are going to cover the vast majority of all the NLEs which are called nonlinear editing systems or film editing systems that many of you are going to be using. We also extensively use tools from Boris FX. We use the Vision 3 Imaging Inc. plugin, which works inside of Adobe Premiere Pro and also Adobe After Effects to do our 3D editing. We talk about some camcorders in the guides from JVC. We use Gen Arts Sapphire and Gen Arts Edge that we're also demoing those products. We use some tools from Red Giant. Pusent Systems is part of the guide that we included two quotes for recommended systems to actually use these tools. You're going to see a video tutorial lesson on the Roina Soft movie poster production software. And I got a funny story on this. I wanted uh, people to make the four movie posters for four movies. And I joined the LinkedIn movie poster group. And I asked for quotes. And I got quotes for $2,500 to $5,000 a movie poster. I mean, these people wanted... 10 to 20 grand to do four movie posters and I wasn't about to lay out that sort of cash. I had to search on the internet almost for two days and I found this company, Roynasoft, which is out of Ukraine, which has a poster making program. It's $29.95 and all of the movie posters that are on our website and I encourage you on our web pages that you can see the movie posters. I made all four of those in less than one day and it was $29.95. So we're giving you that little hint as part of it. And I tell everybody's part of the Roynasoft tutorial that it would be really cool for all of you to do a movie poster. You can put it in your house or at your office or just do something for a more professional presentation if you're going to pitch a product. We also have a tutorial on New Blue FX, which is a titling program. Panasonic, of course, that we film with the Panasonic HDZ Z10,000. We have from Dashwood, Cinema, their stereo 3D toolbox, which is a 3D editing solution for Final Cut Pro. Talk a little about the Intel Xenon processors, and then we also go over some of the functionality, which is in CyberLink PowerDirector, another editing program. We only use that to do slideshows and also to do some conversion to 2D titling to 3D, even though Vision 3 Imaging Inc., which is right here, is now working with New Blue FX to get that stereoscopic 3D titling to work natively within Adobe Premiere Pro. And we're hoping that there's going to be a solution for that. Part of all the tutorials, we're going to go over all these programs and we picked this tool set because we wanted to make sure that after that tutorial, every single one of you was going to be able to utilize these programs. As part of all these programs, we use all the way up to an 18 step process to take the film, which you're going to say, my film doesn't look very good, or gee, after I've gone through the tutorials, the film looks great. What do I got to do to wind up getting through those steps? And we may use 18 different tools that we give tutorial lessons on every one of these tools. And don't faint and don't fall over. The tools are easy to use. And after you go through the video tutorials, you will understand how simple and easy these tools are to use. We have the streaming service for you to go back and be able to practice with these tools on the tutorial film that we have and then go back and try it on your film. We're going to go back to the prior slide, but I just want, wanted to show you in this slide that we actually can do up to five renders on our film. And the reason that we do five renders is because some of these renders are GPU or graphical processor units driven and other ones are CPU, which is your central processing unit. 
some of these particular effects, such as noise reduction and optical stabilizer and Adobe Warp Stabilizer, they're going through each one of these pixels through millions and millions of calculation to get rid of the noise in the film. And you'll see noise as part of the tutorial. Once you see how we reduce the noise, you're going to go back to your film and say, my film has got noise in it. I need to do the noise reduction. Sapphire Sharpen also is a separate render in itself because that also requires a lot of computational power. We have the sequences like this because it winds up that if you randomly try to go and mix these together, that your box will really slow down. So in other words, if you have the Sapphire Sharpen tool with the BCC Optical Stabilizer, those calculations can take up to 10 times longer, which is why that we put together this sequence through literally, and I'll say this again, literally, thousands of renders to figure out this sequence of how you wind up applying these tools so that your box will be relatively responsive and you're going to be able to get through these renders and not all of a sudden turn around and say, well, I have a 200 hour render on my hand because you actually combined these particular renders in the wrong order. So we've turned around and laid all these out for you and as part of the tutorials, we step you through these tools in the order of how you're supposed to apply them. We have figured out all these steps for you, including tools that are easy to use, that are gonna do massive improvement to your film, and then putting them in the order of how you have to wind up applying. So let's go back up to the one slide two slides ago. One, the tools we use require modern computers. These tools are not gonna run on a dual CPU. They aren't even recommended to run on an i7 four core. You can wind up getting through it, but you're gonna have long wait times. If you wind up moving, of course, if we have a recommended i7 six core with 32 gigs of RAM, if you wind up moving to this box, these effects are going to have a much better responsive rate and your renders are gonna go down not by 100%, but by three or 400%. Something that may take 60 hours under a four core computer that you're gonna find out under an i7 six core with 32 gigs of RAM that that render is gonna take 15 hours. I just want you all to remember that if you do not wind up upgrading your box to a six core computer, which are starting to come into the mainstream, you are gonna have some long render times on these renders. When you see these tolls and the reflection in my voice and the excitement when I'm showing you these tools, I turn around and say that these are must-have effects that you must do to your film. Under point three, some of these effects have very long renders. Let's go up to point two again. Recommended i7 six core, 32 gigs of RAM. I have a 3930 six core chipset, which I actually acquired two years ago. And I was getting some non-responsiveness out of my box, including long render time. And we called up the software vendors and had a discussion with them. And the general consensus was that we had to move to a multi-CPU Xenon processor machine with two NVIDIA Titan cards. And I called up Dell and that box was $12,000. We decided to order it anyway because we have to be productive because we're doing this stuff every single day. Before I decide to pull the trigger, I worked very closely with Puget Systems which is right here on this symbol here, that they're out of Seattle. They've been in business since the year 2000. They build a couple hundred boxes a month and they build higher end machines, which are not necessarily built in the stores. They graciously, and I must say graciously, that this group was such a great group. They did 28 render tests, 28 separate render tests using the effects and the orders the way that we do them. And they did it on an i7 six core, which is our recommended machine right now. They also did it on a single Xenon chipset, which are about two to three times more than the i7 six core. And they also did it on a dual Xenon chipset. And we thought that we were gonna see massive reduction in rendering times through the dual Xenon. Well, guess what? It didn't happen. It wound up the i7 six core, which is a consumer level chip, actually had the fastest rendering time in almost all of the tests and the single Xenon CPU chips in many instances had much slower rendering times. And then surprisingly, that really shocked us, the dual Xenon chips rendered slower than the single Xenon chip. I immediately canceled the order from Dell and did not move forward with it. And we had Puget Systems put together a recommended configuration 
which is about $5,000, which is a lot cheaper than 12,000 bucks. And it wound up the i7 in many tests rendered many of these effects twice as fast. Another shocker that we had, because Pugin Systems previously on September 27th, 2013, published a very nice article comparing the render times using up to 10 different video cards. And it wound up that looking at the render time, if you had a dual Titan GPU, and the Titan card is a NVIDIA consumer level GTX graphic card that sells for about $1,000. It wound up if you had two Titan video cards, the rendering times for 4K footage, compared to my NVIDIA 4000 card, which I bought a year and a half ago for about 1400 bucks, it wound up a dual Titan setup rendered 4K footage approximately four times faster. We thought that we were also going to wind up getting better results from having a dual Titan card. Well, it wound up that the render test Pugin Systems did was 4K film using Adobe Premiere Pro, which is the only nonlinear editing system which is currently taking advantages of multiple GPU cards. You can put two video cards in there and it'll wind up using the computational power to rendering or processing the effects which use the GPU instead of the CPU. Well, it wound up, we didn't get any performance increase at all because all of the tools we use from all the vendors, none of them have been coded to take advantage of multiple video cards in an array put inside of your box. And that was another shocker we had based on doing this testing that we finally turned around and said a Xenon chipset was out, a dual Xenon chipset was out, and there was no reason to have dual GPU NVIDIA Titan cards inside of that box, thus saving all the readers of the guide an additional thousand dollars because the effects that we used, which are critical to color correct, denoise, stabilize, and sharpen the film, the underwater footage, they right now do not take advantage of multiple GPUs. Now, it doesn't mean that the vendors such as Boris and Gen Arts and Tiffin DFX are not going to come back and wind up releasing a program to take advantage of it in the future. But when they do, we will send out an email blast as part of our subscription program, and you will be informed which vendors are now taking advantage of that multiple GPU, and that's when you go and wind up buying the card. As of right now, some of these effects have very long renders on the stabilization and denoise using the recommended box we have for an hour film that that render is probably going to take upwards of 25 hours. You may wind up saying 25 hours, but if you're not in the film processing business full time, what you do is you start to render and you go to work. And you come back in 24 hours, it's done, and your film has been beautiful, denoised, and you don't have to go out and wind up spending a boatload of cash to try to figure out what the best way is to do it. We've already done that for you, including having these render test results run, which are actually down in the guide for both the article that Pugin Systems did at the end of September comparing GPU render speeds and also that we included the Excel spreadsheet chart in there of the results of doing the render test using all these different tool sets. Because some of the effects are GPU driven under number four, CPU speeds are only part of the equation. And in order to get the most out of your box, you are gonna have to have a relatively fast CPU and also a fast the GPU. This doesn't mean you can't get through with the hardware you have. You're just gonna have to wind up realizing some of these renders are going to wind up being long and you may even have to do more renders to break these tool sets up. But I think that we have broken up the tool sets to allow you to be able to wade through and chug through on an i7 four core computer to get through these processes. You are going to get frustrated and in some of these particular effects that we're applying, you are not going to have a great response on that particular box. And I want you all to be conscious of that fact. That's really... Rule 14, we tell you to, on page 41 of the guide, the current page 41 of the guide, and we're always changing the guide, so the page numbers may change. You have to follow these steps the way that we do it and do the render. So here we have render one. So you're going to apply all these effects, and then you do render one. And then you apply effect number two, and you do render two. Then you come to these optical stabilizer and the flicker fixer, and you do render number three. 
and then you come along and you apply these other particular tools that are in here and you do render number four and then on sapphire sharpen you do render number five as a separate render we actually have the noise reduction under step eight bcc noise reduction and sapphire sharpen as separate renders so i want you all to be informed and realize you need to follow the steps that we're giving you we have done these tests we know what the best mix is based on going through these procedures and we are taking a lot of frustration out of this equation to make sure that based on the machine that you're going to have it is going to function in the best way possible under 9 and 10 which is the optical stabilizer we have optical stabilizer, Adobe Warp Stabilizer, and also what's called Flicker Fixer. And Flicker is kind of like you have a lightning bolt goes through your film and it, you get a flash. If you have a four core computer, you may not be able to use Flicker Fixer on that render, but you can just try it. But in order to do that, you first want to do the optimal stabilization, which is for shots that you have a lockdown effect filming on a tripod. And you want to use the Adobe Warp Stabilizer for shots when you're swimming along the reef. And we actually show you why you want to use those different tools depending upon the type of film that you have. It just winds up that Adobe Warp Stabilizer does a better job of fixing film when you're freelancing and swimming along the reef. Please make sure that you keep that chart in mind and you follow the sequences that we're giving you because we have figured this stuff out for you where you don't have to get super frustrated and all of a sudden that you're combining two effects out of order and it's taken forever for your box to even wind up applying those effects. Rule 15, safety always comes first. Everybody has to understand when we're going over these lessons, the idea is to be able to get great film, but we want to make sure that we wind up getting that in the safest manner possible. And if something happens, I always remember the three rules that Barrow, who was a dive master on Aruba, and Tito, who was another dive master, and Barrow had about 50,000 dives and Tito had about 60,000 dives under their belt. And Barrow on the dive boat would always say, stop, think, and react. If you ever wind up getting in trouble, what you first do is you stop, you calm down, you think about what the problem is, and then you react to the problem in a well thought out logical manner. And this is very important when you're filming underwater because under rule two, Filming reduces awareness of your surroundings. When you're filming and you're concentrating on a three inch monitor, or I film with a five inch monitor, that has significantly reduced my field of plane and what I'm seeing in front of me because I'm staring in to a much smaller monitor and many times I'm trying to keep the subject or the critter in the middle of the screen. And therefore I may not be aware of what's going on to the left to the right, what's below me, especially a lot of times I am not necessarily 100% aware of exactly what is below me. I want to make sure that everybody understands that when you're filming that that increases the risk when you're scuba diving. Anyone who says that filming does not increase the risk of when you're scuba diving is not making a correct statement. Under rule three, you must terminate. And once again, you must terminate all filming at the lowest level of 750 PSI. You need to get on that boat with 500 pound pressure and I don't care what comes swimming by. Whether it's a manta ray, whether it's a whale shark, you must terminate your filming at 750 pounds PSI and start your ascent back to the surface. You cannot get on that boat with 200 pounds of pressure. It is not worth under number four, that last one shot is not worth the risk. I want everyone to be cognizant of when you're filming and you're descending to the depths or you're on that critter, you may lose track of how many pounds you have and you may lose track of what depth you're at. So once again, you need to pay attention to what's on your dive computer and check that periodically throughout while you're filming and when you get below a thousand pounds, you have to be cognizant that you are running out of air and therefore, no matter how great that one last shot is, you have to terminate your filming when you hit 750 pounds PSI. Under number five, you must always, and once again, always have DAN insurance, Divers Alert Network. 
you need to be a member of Dan and you need to have that insurance in case something happens and you have to go into a decompression chamber. Because you don't want to turn around and have to wind up getting a ten or twenty thousand dollar bill and wind up being laid up when you could have paid one hundred and fifty or two hundred dollars a year and had that proper insurance. You also need to call Dan, and they go through an independent third party who's going to wind up insuring your equipment. And it's important that you have your equipment insured because it may get lost, stolen, it may fall over the boat. There's a myriad of reasons. I want everybody to understand under Rule Fifteen. Safety always comes first. Rule 16, practice buoyancy with your unit. The top three things to wind up getting great film are know the limits of your camcorder. Number two, always film with a red filter unless you're filming in macro mode with lights on. And number three is going to be to practice your buoyancy with your unit. And when I refer to practice with your equipment, I don't care whether it's in a pole or whether it's on your first couple dives, you need to make sure that you are able to maintain your buoyancy and control of your up and down with that equipment on you. And your equipment, if you add a dive light to your housing unit or an external monitor, it's going to wind up changing the buoyancy of your equipment. And you're going to kind of be surprised about how fast that stuff can sink by just adding one or two extra dive lights. Two, work on improving and perfecting your buoyancy. If you're buoyant, you are going to approach those critters with the critters in the middle of the screen and not bobbing up and down. And we have talked about making a beeline towards a point which is on the coral reef and try not to go up and down. And as you get closer to the subject, that's going to create the natural zoom. In order to be able to get, especially the close-up shots, if you're in an environment, let's say Bonaire, there's very little current, you want to be able to be stationary when you see something like an eel or some really great shot, such as a sea anemone, you have to have great buoyancy. Number three, buoyancy allows you to maintain position. When you have those great shots, like an eel, and that eel is not going to move, and if you cannot get that thing on a tripod to film that eel, you have to be able to have that buoyancy and not have that camera go all over the place. And the only way to keep that camcorder steady is that you're going to have to be able to somehow get it to the point that you significantly improve your buoyancy. Number four, if you have greater buoyancy, you're going to have better control over that camcorder and you're going to get longer shots on those money shots. Number five, the film should look like a home aquarium. And in order to make it look like a home aquarium, you're either going to have to wind up filming on a tripod or else you're going to have to really perfect your buoyancy skills. Continuation of Rule 16, practice buoyancy with your unit. One, let the action come to the screen plane. If you have great buoyancy, you can sit there and allow that camcorder to be stationary. And sometimes I pull it right up to my chest, as we talked about, as part of the little video that we watched from Lesson 17. I can let that action come to the screen plane and not chase the critters. Two, with greater buoyancy, you're not going to wind up moving the camera and you're going to be able to maintain the steadiness and the stabilization tools from Adobe and Boris Continuum Complete are going to return much better results. Three, determine your path and maintain your buoyancy. You need to plan your path and make a beeline between points. You don't go to the left. You don't go to the right. You don't move the camera all around. You pick a coral head that's 20 yards down the reef line and you swim in the straightest path that you can without going up and down. And that's going to do two things. One is you approach that particular coral head, you're going to wind up getting brighter and better fish. And it's also going to wind up creating a natural zoom as we talked about in some of the shots. In order to have that flowing effect and that professional look to your film, you want to be able to approach that beeline and swim along that beeline path without going up and down. Four, that goes once again to approaching the subjects, creating a natural zoom. If in fact that you're swimming without going up and down and you keep that beeline object in the middle of your viewfinder, that is going to create a natural zoom without having to press on the zoom control. Because when you press on a zoom control, unless you have a very high-end housing, you're going to wind up getting some movement on it. So what I do is I do a beeline and that naturally creates a zoom effect. Number five, do not chase the critters with the camcorder. We've discussed this extensively. 
My particular style is I like to let the camcorder run for longer periods of time and let the nature take place as if I'm watching and viewing a fish tank in my house. The way that I get that effect is I do not chase the critters. Rule 17, properly maintain your housing. Your housing is a sophisticated and sensitive device. And we talked about you would not take your iPhone and wind up dropping it kicking it over, or even putting it underwater, you would treating it with a lot of care. And your housing, which is more expensive than an iPhone, in many instances, six or seven times more expensive than your iPhone, should be treated with the same amount of sensitivity and care. Many of these controls, which are on your housing units, can wind up being calibrated to one one thousandths of an inch. And if you wind up turning them over or having something hit them, that can result in a slight leakage or leakage going into your housing unit. So you want to pick these units up with fine care and you want to place them down also with fine care. Three, periodically apply silicon grease. We all know related to the gasket on these particular housings, you have to make sure that there's no sand on them and you should also apply silicon grease. On my Equinox housing units, I have these pulleys and I occasionally also apply silicon grease to the pulleys which will make sure that they're operating properly. Four, discuss with the manufacturer proper care procedures. In many instances you've paid $1,000 to $4,000 for your housing unit. If in fact that, that manufacturer is unwilling before you purchase the unit to discuss the care procedures, you need to go find someone else. If that manufacturer does not have posted on their website something that tells you how to care for the units, you need to buy from another manufacturer. A one-page sheet telling you how to take care of your housing unit is not enough. Number five, consider having a backup unit. And a backup unit can take many forms. I film with a Panasonic HDZ Z10,000 unit that fully loaded with lights and the camcorder and everything else is well in excess of $10,000. I have a backup unit which is a JVC 3D HD camcorder which resides in the Equinox HD6 housing. That unit costs approximately five grand. On my next trip when I'm going to be filming in Mexico on assignment, I'm going to take a GoPro. I'm really going to have three additional units and also on our website we started selling housing units for an iPhone and also a Galaxy 2 and 3. And that may be something that you can wind up slotting in your bag if you have a Galaxy or an iPhone that you can buy one of these really nice units or about $189. If something happens to your main recording unit, at least you can whip out your phone. The film isn't going to be as good as what you're filming with your camcorder, but at least you're going to be able to return home with something. Rule 18, lights, lights, and more lights. And in the book, I stated a very famous saying in Hollywood is lights, camera, action. And in the underwater world, it's lights, lights, and lights. First, lights after 20 feet of depth are poor visibility. After I go down 20 feet in the Caribbean, I'm going to wind up having my lights on. And if I'm in a worse visibility, something like California waters where the visibility in the water may be 20 or 30 feet, it is imperative that you have lights. Two, the effective reach of your lights is going to be 5 to 10 feet. Lights are not going to have a 20 to 30 foot reach, even though on our website we are now selling the new big blue light, which has got 15,000 illumes to it. It is extremely strong. I'm currently filming with a light that has 2,500 illumes. That one light is actually going to be six times brighter. Having a brighter light does not necessarily wind up giving you better results. If you have too strong of a light that so you're going to get a lot of bounce off and reflection on the coral and you're actually going to get washed out or whited out film and therefore that you have to be careful of using very powerful lights because you may actually wind up getting worse results. Three, pointing a light into the water is going to have very little effect. The reach in the water to brighten up the fish is only going to be about three to five feet. Do not expect by pointing your lights into the water that you're going to get a tremendous amount of reach onto fish swimming into the water. Four, always try to position the lights to hit the coral or a structure. If you are free floating along a reef 
and the reef is to the right, as on the big three in Cozumel, you always start with the reef on the right and you wind up floating to the north. You want to have both of those lights, or if you have a third light, pointed and positioned to try to light up the reef so you're going to wind up getting some colorization. And you have to be cognizant of that fact that when you're swimming along, especially on a drift dive, you are going to have to adjust the angles of how those lights point. And that is something that you're going to gain through experience and you have to practice with it. Five, a night dive always, and let me say this again, always requires a primary and secondary light. And what I mean by a secondary light is a small light that fits into your BC. You cannot do a night dive without having a secondary light. Rule 18, lights, lights, and more lights continue. One, buy the best lights that you can afford. If you go cheap, I guarantee you, you will always want to have better lights. And you should be prepared to spend for two lights approximately $1,000 and up. Two, before you buy the lights, review the battery life and the recharge time and also read the manuals to see how long the battery life is. Some vendors will wind up putting on there the lights last for an hour and a half when the truth is that's on their lowest setting. Three, get lights that have more than one setting. I film with the big blue lights and they have four different settings on them because once again, you may have to wind up toning down your lights if you're actually getting a macro shot, you may not want to have those blaring lights because you're going to wind up getting hot spots in your film. You want to make sure that you have lights that have multiple settings that are very easy to use. Four, try to have two lights to balance your unit. Now, I've been going around because I just got done writing the guide for the GoPro, and all these people are selling these trays that you save 10 bucks on that they only have one handle. I do not agree in that setup. I think in order to maintain proper balance and also to keep that camcorder as steady as you can, you need a tray that has two handles on it that your left and right hand are holding the unit and preferably you should have two lights so that that unit or tray or whatever you're using is going to have the same amount of weight on both sides of your units. That is just going to wind up helping with the steadiness and your ability to control the situation as you're filming. And then five, as I discussed in the guide, provide dive lights to non-divers. My wife and daughter love the dive with a big blue light which is attached to their wrists because they like to hunt for critters. The lights enable them to be able to peer into the crevices to try to find those really nice critters that they can wind up signaling you over to come and wind up filming. Secondly, we all know when you wind up putting your lights on the reef that the magical colors come alive when those lights hit them. Your wife, daughter, son, or other people that are diving with you, they should have the same opportunity to experience these colorful wonders of nature exactly as you are when you're pointing your dive lights against a coral. One, lights are part of the equation. And we talked about four main items that we're gonna review here in a second about the four things that you need to get your great film back. Two, the type of camcorder you have and the size of the sensor, the use of a red filter, lights and software, and the post-production procedures, which we're going to get ready to go over after we finish the 20 rules, are all critical for you to be able to get the great film. Three, you need all four factors to get great footage. Not three of the four and not two of the four. You need all four factors. You need a camcorder, which is made for underwater, that's going to perform well in a low light environment. You need a red filter. You need preferably two lights. And you need to do post-production processing on your film. An example is you must make sure that you have the right camcorder. On our website, we saw a housing from Canon and only two camcorders from Canon. We have those two camcorders because they fit inside of the Canon housing and they also come with a built-in electronic red filter. Four, when you make the investment, you are going to see the results. Spending $6,000 on an underwater housing unit, an external monitor, and also the camcorder and not investing in lights, and another $500 to $1,000 for the software is just plain foolish. Five, be prepared to spend over $1,000 on your lights. Getting lights that have 500 looms 
and they cost $400 is not going to buy you much and you're just going to be wasting your money. Earlier on the prior slide that we talked about the multiple factors to get great film. And this little five circle show you what you need. A camcorder and knowing its sweet spots. You need a proper red filter and remember there's different red filters depending upon the environment you're filming in. You may have a different colored red filter for 30 feet and above as you do on the deeper depths. You need to get a magenta or pinkish type of filter for filming in greenish water such as California. And you need a much darker filter if you're filming in a lake environment which has got really dark blue water. The third item you need is lights. And always make sure that you try to get the best lights you can that's going to have at least an hour and a half battery life with 2,500 looms at least on each light, including getting two. Fourth, you must do the post-production procedures on your film. And you can go out on the internet where they're showing the results they're getting with only a red filter. We actually posted a video where someone was using a GoPro and they filmed it without a red filter and then they put the SRP red filter on it and everybody thought it was great. While well, we posted a video of taking the GoPro film which was filmed with a red filter and now doing our post-production procedures to it and it blows that film away. The fifth thing is follow the 20 rules. Study them understand what they mean by the second filming trip that you go on they will be instinctive you will not have to read them again and your filming results are going to be magnificent rule 19 remember to bring the extras one have an extra housing gasket and silicon I was filming on Aruba and one of my gaskets to the Canon camcorder started the leak and the housing started to leak. I thought it was sand. So I cleaned out the gasket and took it back down. And it was leaking again. Luckily, I had an extra housing gasket that I put on that unit. And that solved the problems. Your gasket may get bent. It may break. It may get kinked. And the other thing is you should be replacing your gaskets every year. For $15, why risk a significant investment? Because if your housing floods, your camcorder is gone. Two. Make sure to bring a six plug power strip and an extra light. A six plug power strip should always be in your bag. You are going to wind up having your computer plugged in. You're going to have your camcorder charging. You're going to wind up having some other device. You're going to be charging your lights. You're going to be charging the battery to the camcorder. You need to bring a six plug power strip. Three. Make sure you bring extra red filters. And we've talked about this. They're made out of plastic. They can get scratched. They can break. They can get bent. There's lots of other things. For $30 or $40, you want to make sure you have the extra red filter. Four, make sure that your film editing software is loaded and tested. So when you get off the plane, you are able to import that film from your camcorder and review your film every night. By reviewing your film on a daily basis, you will be able to see what's working and not working, whether you're moving the camcorder too fast, and your skills and the quality of, of your film will rapidly improve. Five, think about bringing a second camcorder, battery, and tripod. And what I refer to as the second camcorder, it may not be the unit you're filming with, but at least bring a GoPro. 19. Remember to bring the extras. A power strip, extra battery, silicon grease, gasket, red filters, an extra camera, editing system loaded, external backup drive, a tripod, connect cables and cords, SDXC cards, a dongle cord to make sure that you can attach your camcorder housing to your BC, and cleaning materials and cloth. And these are just the beginning of the type of items that you should bring and make sure that you do a checklist before you get on that airplane. And our last rule, number 20, KISS. We all know what this means. Keep it simple, stupid. One, use as few controls as possible and work on your buoyancy and making a beeline and keeping that camcorder steady. That is going to wind up giving you much more better film than tweaking around with 15 different controls. Two, I use start, stop, and white balance. I never use zoom and I basically ignore all the other controls. Three, reduce your complexity. 
you are going to have enough going on filming underwater, looking down the reef, and trying to keep that critter in the middle of the screen. And remember, filming increases risk. You want to make sure that you're thinking about all these factors when you're out filming, including stop, think, and react. When you see that pot of fish sitting down the coral line 20 yards away, I want everybody to think about getting those critters, your setup, your lights in motion, turning your lights on and getting those critters in the middle of the screen and then making a beeline. That is enough complexity in itself when you go filming. Four, you want to get the lockdown effect, perfect your buoyancy, and keep that camcorder steady. And five, if your unit is too complicated, just get a new one. That's the end of our 20 basic rules, and we're going to do a recap of the 20 basic rules. I know this lesson was extremely long. We spent a long time on it. It took up the entire morning, but now you know what the basic rules are from a filming strategy point of view. And in the afternoon, that we're actually going to be reviewing footage, loading it into Premiere Pro, and going through some of the magnificent tools that are going to show you the wonderful results you can wind up getting with the film. But the film that we're going to be correcting, the first thing you're going to notice is it's stable and we followed our rules during the filming. Recap of the 20 basic rules. Rule 1, summary, test, and understand the limitations of your unit. Rule 2, Film at 35 feet and less, if possible, for the best color results. Rule three, have at least one eye of the critter in the shot. Rule four, film with the current. Rule five, use a tripod if possible, but I recommend a private boat if you're going to use a tripod. Overweight yourself if you use a tripod. Rule six, always wear a full length wetsuit. Rule seven, try to have water across the top 25% of your shot Attempt to have water take up one half of the screen area or one third of the screen area if the water is in the shot at an angle. Water creates infinity space perspective and the rich blue will make the other colors pop. Rule 8. Take your time and swim in a semicircle until the tones in the water and the subject have the best look. Consider the angle of the sun and particulate matter when making the final decision of how to approach the subject. Rule 9. Always be looking into the horizon on the reef line. Stop, get set up, have the subject or critter in the middle of the viewfinder and the camcorder on before you begin your approach. Rule 10. A 45 degree angle shot with surface water can provide an exciting viewing experience and an additional element of movement in the scene for the viewer. Rule 11, always use a red filter except when using lights and filming in a macro environment. Rule 12, back up and review your film every night. Your filming style and skills will rapidly improve. Rule 13, use the tools we recommend and in the sequence we recommend they be used. Buy a unit that meets your budget and needs and understand there are inherent filming depth limits to the units. Review Rule 1 again. Rule 14, Get the computing power you need and save your marriage and personal life. Do not have your staff sitting around doing nothing. Rule 15. Terminate all filming and turn off your camcorder when you have 750 pounds of pressure left. Obtain and maintain your Diver Alert Network DAN membership. Get flood insurance through DAN. Rule 16. Practice your buoyancy with your underwater unit and strategically think about how to have a straight line to the subject you are going to film. Always strive to achieve a lockdown look as if you were viewing an aquarium. Rule 17. Maintain your housing unit and apply silicon grease anytime the unit is open. Treat it with the same respect it deserves. Rule 18. Purchase at least two powerful underwater lights. Contact Equinox Housing to discuss the best solution. Be prepared to spend over 1000 Always use a red filter in combination with the lights. Think how the lights should be positioned to hit a portion of the reef. Make sure to also complete post-production procedures that make the true colors return. Rule 19, remember to bring the extras. And Rule 20, kiss.